Good afternoon. At the outset, I would like to thank Hyderabad ISC SIM chapter and Samradev sir for giving me this opportunity. So, uh, after the excellent morning session, I will try to keep the tempo and uh, in the next 30 minutes, I will be talking about cardiorenal syndrome. So, <clears throat> coming to the case Vignet, a 45-year-old male who is a known diabetic already on oral hypoglycemic agents, hypertensive on beta blockers and AC inhibitors, who is morbidly obese, probably has an OSA component, presents with sudden onset chest pain and shortness of breath. When you look at the ECG, there was uh, ST depressions in the inferior leads, but ECHO and a drop were negative. ECO was not showing any RWMA. And when you go to the vitals, the blood pressure was on the higher side with the BP of 180 by 80, whose usual baseline blood pressure was around 130 by 90. Heart rate was around 60 per minute with a respiratory rate of 30 per minute as saturation of 88% on room air, which increased to 95% with oxygen. So with this chest pain, with this history, the only diagnosis which we can make is angina as the drop is negative. So uh, when the labs have come, the HB is 12. The WBC count is 14,500. He had a platelet of 350,000 with a creat of 1.6 and a potassium of 5.7. And you can see the chest X-ray obviously shows pulmonary edema, which is glaring at you. So the questions which are raised is why is the TL WBC count elevated? What is the reason for creatinine elevation with the echo, which is absolutely normal and a blood pressure, in fact, which is on the higher side? What is the reason for the hyperkalemia? The cardiology resident has come and is given a list of medications, statin, labetalol, infusion, statins, antiplatelets, diuretics, AC inhibitors, and has asked for NIV. Uh, so uh, are, is, are all these medications justified? So we'll try to understand this as we understand the pathophysiology of cardiorenal syndrome. So cardiorenal syndrome, as the, as the word itself says, it, in, it involves the damage or the failure of heart and the kidney. As you know, the, both these organs are closely interlinked. Failure of one organ exacerbates the failure of other organ. And as a result of which, they are together given a syndrome approach. So there are other multiple contributing factors also like elderly age group, uh, other comorbidities like diabetes, uh, hypertension, uh, uh, hyperlipidemia, which again uh, predispose these patients uh, to worsening uh, organ failures. The reason why we need to know about cardiorenal syndrome is whenever you have a dual organ failure, the morbidity and mortality are higher. Broadly, they are classified into five types, type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, and type 5. For ease of remembrance, type 1 and type 2 can be remembered as cardiorenal syndrome, and type 3 and type 4 can be remembered as renocardiac syndrome because the first organ to get affected in type 1 and type 2 is the heart, which leads to renal failure, and in type 3 and type 4, the first organ to get affected is kidney, which leads to heart failure. So as the name suggests, type 1 is acute cardiorenal syndrome, that is an acute heart failure leading to acute kidney injury. Type 2 is a chronic cardiorenal syndrome, that is a chronic heart failure leading to chronic kidney disease. And type 3 and type 4 is an acute kidney injury leading to acute heart failure and a chronic kidney injury leading to chronic heart failure. And type 5 CRS is a secondary CRS wherein a systemic disorder like a, a, an amyloidosis and an SLE or a septic shock will lead to heart and kidney failure. Moving forward, first we'll talk about CRS1 and CRS2. So uh, coming to the pathophysiology of CRS1 and CRS2, as we all know, whenever there is an acute coronary syndrome or, a, or an ACS or an NSTEMI, there you can see a, either a left ventricular or a right ventricular dysfunction. So whenever there is a left ventricular dysfunction, there can be a decreased stroke volume effectively leading to reduced cardiac output, as a result of which there will be an activation of RAS, sympathetic nervous system and vasopressin, and as a result of which there will be vasoconstriction, sodium and water retention, as a result of which there will be decreased renal perfusion, and as a result of which there will be reduced GFR. And whenever you have a right heart failure or right heart dysfunction, there will be impaired venous drainage and as a result of which renal venous drainage will be impaired leading to decreased renal perfusion as renal perfusion pressure will be reduced. As you already know, renal perfusion pressure is equal to mean arterial pressure minus CVP. Whenever the CVP is elevated, renal perfusion pressure will come down. 
similar whole goods for every each and every org where in the organ perfusion pressure is nothing but the mean arterial pressure minus cvp so a little bit about the renin angiotensin system as you all know whenever you have a hypotension uh, your uh, kidney activates the renin uh, and as a result of which angiotensin in the liver gets converted to angiotensin 1 which in the uh, in fact in the lung gets converted to angiotensin 2 and as you already know angiotensin 2 has three actions one it uh, release release of aldosterone by acting in the adrenal cortex and as a result of which there will be sodium and water retention acting on the endothelium causing vasoconstriction and acting on the hypothalamus and production of vasopressin all of which together can cause elevated blood pressure apart this uh, along with which renin angiotensin system which also activates nadph oxidase and as a result of which there is increased uh, reactive oxygen species production and as a result of which there is an activation of inflammatory cascade which can result in a cytokine storm kind of a picture which you see in sepsis or septic shock and as a result of which you can have your inflammatory mediators which are elevated like in our patient we have seen a tlc which is elevated and the tlc elevation doesn't mean it's an infection it's an inflammatory cascade which happens even in your acute coronary syndrome or angina so uh, what the hemodynamic events like i already told you you can have a decreased cardiac output or an increased venous congestion and a ras and a sympathetic nervous system activation which will lead to decreased renal blood flow uh, worsening renal venous congestion increased interstitial pressure impaired renal auto regulation decreased renal perfusion pressure and finally reduced gfr in this increased venous pressure is more important than the increased decreased cardiac output as you have seen in our particular patient the cardiac output was pretty good but still there was an acute kidney injury probably secondary to the venous congestion so apart from the hemodynamic there are non hemodynamic related like activation of ras increased reactive oxygen species chronic inflammatory uh, status and drug induced like use of other use of uh, nephrotoxic agents uh, so broadly the uh, pathophysiological basis for crs1 it could be either a hemodynamically mediated damage or a humoral mediated damage because of ras and sns activation or uh, immune mediated damage because of uh, reactive oxygen species production or finally exogenous factors like contrast media which can further worsen the kidney injury in the acute heart failure so going back to a case the tlc was elevated because of the inflammatory response uh, seen in the angina or acs hyperkalemia is most probably secondary to the ac inhibitors elevated creatinine in spite of a uh, preserved ejection fraction could be secondary to the increased venous pressure or any other pathophysiological uh, condition which might have happened as i explained in the previous slides which has led to the crs1 in my particular case we met a patient in pulmonary edema even though if the patient is in aki he needs diuretics he needs decongestion without which uh his shortness of breath will won't come down and his ak also doesn't improve in fact uh, crs1 and 2 most of the times is secondary to hypervolemia uh, so importance of venous congestion for worsening renal function in advanced decompensated heart failure is a trial published in american college of cardiology where in 145 patients with acute decompensated heart failure were treated with the help of a pulmonary artery catheter and what they found was all those who had a worsened kidney function had a greater cvp at admission and even after intensive medical therapy and as a result of which venous decongestion is most important hemodynamic uh, factor in improving the renal function in acute decompensated heart failure patients so what is the management of crs1 uh, and 2 uh, reduce the fluid and sodium intake uh, decongested decongestion of the patient either by using a thiazide either by using a loop diuretic or a thiazide diuretic or by using ultra filtration and uh, uh, adding an inotrope if the patient is in uh, shock uh, with lv dysfunction adding a vasodilator uh, if the patient's blood pressure is very high like in our own case where the blood pressure was very high we went ahead and added a beta blocker <clears throat> uh, starting an ultra filtration Uh, then inserting insertion of an intraaortic balloon pump in a patient with acute coronary syndrome uh, for a, for the stunned myocardium uh, for for as a bridge for the stunned myocardium to start functioning again or using an aicd or a pacemaker if the patient is having any rhythm issues 
So coming to the diuretics, loop diuretics are most commonly used. Furosemide, bumetanide, torsemide are the most common diuretic class. They can be used alone or used in conjunction with uh, uh, other diuretics. A little bit of loop diuretic, as you already know, it is very tightly protein bound. It is not filtered because at the GA glomerulus because it is tightly protein bound. Uh, it is uh, so for it to act, it, to, it has to reach the loop of NLA. So it reaches through the proximal convoluted tubule with the help of organic anion transporters uh, and it acts on the sodium potassium chloride co-transporters in the thing, a thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. <clears throat> so like I already told you, it is transported into the PCT with the organic anion transporters and it acts in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. So for the diuretic to act, there should be integrity of the tubul tubular function, the presence of organic acids, uh, to uh, pump the uh, 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 loop diuretics into the proximal coronary tubule. Uh, then uh, based on the severity of AKA, the dose has to be modified. So how should the dose be modified? When there is a moderate renal insufficiency, 80 to 160 mg of elastic should be sufficient. And there is severe renal insufficiency. In fact, you have to go up on the dose to 160 to 200 mg and torsamide and vimetinide doses also should be adjusted based on the kidney function. And one more thing is, they do not have a, a smooth or a linear dose response curve. So whenever a 20 mg of LASIX doesn't work, you have to give a higher dose, but not a same dose two times or three times a day because it doesn't work. A higher dose when a lower dose is not working is a dictum. So uh, <clears throat> then moving forward, diuretic resistance. So uh, the, you patients, you, you may have find diuretic resistance because of number of factors like a delayed intestinal absorption because of the mucosal edema in a congestive heart failure patients, decreased renal perfusion, and as a result of which the NF concentration doesn't lead, uh, doesn't reach the kidney, decreased diuretic excretion into the urine, inadequate drug dosing like in a, a KI or a CKD, you need to increase your loop diuretic dose and concomitant use of nephrotoxic drugs, which cause nephrotox renal vasoconstriction as a result of which will decrease renal perfusion. Finally, dietary non-compliance <clears throat> causing excessive salt intake, uh, excessive salt intake, uh, which will uh, uh, result in increased fluid retention in spite of using diuretics. So how will you treat a diuretic resistance uh, patient? By uh, either changing from a fixed dose to an infusion, uh, like for a furosemide, you can make it a 10 mg per hour infusion and adding a thiazide diuretic <clears throat> or a, uh, a spironolactone. So the uh, uh, continuous infusion will lead to optimal and effective rate of drug delivery and uh, in turn inhibits sodium reabsorption better. And when you combine a loop and thiazide, it will cause sequential blockade of sodium reabsorption both at the thick ascending loop of loop of NLA and the distal conduct tubule where loop and thiazide diuretics act. A Cochrane review has uh, reviewed eight trials comparing infusion of loop diuretic with a bolus injection in 254 patients with heart failure. And what they concluded, they concluded that the urine output was better, the duration of hospitalization was shortened, and there was no difference in the ototoxicity with compared, inf uh, compared uh, comparing infusion with a bolus dose. So probably bolus infusion is always better. And you can combine a metalazone or a hydrochlorothiazide or an acetazolamide or a spironolactone in the following dosages. In spite of all this, if the patient is still fluid overloaded and if you are not able to decongest the patient, then those are the subset of patients where you can think of ultrafiltration. So what are the trials in ultrafiltration? These are the various trials. In 2005, there was a rapid congestive heart failure uh, trial. In 2007, there was an unload trial. In 2012, there was a caress heart failure trial. 2016 avoid heart failure trial, but these are all the trials done. Unload heart failure trial was the only positive trial wherein they said that ultrafiltration reduced the 90-day readmission rates in uh, decomp uh, with decompensated heart failure. All the remaining trials did not show any difference between diuretic usage versus ultrafiltration in non-oliguric patients. So uh, ultrafiltration uh, comes with a potential greater risk. Uh, so as long as your diuretics are working, there is no role of ultrafiltration and American College of Cardiology doesn't recommend it as a first-line treatment. So whenever you need a solute removal in an acute decomposited heart failure, the diuretics are the drug of choice with fluid restriction. But if they are not working, if the patient goes into an oliguric uh, 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 renal failure, 
then those are the subset where you should think of a mechanical fluid removal with a renal replacement therapy inotropes <coughs> you can use uh, uh, inotrope if the patient has a lv dysfunction uh, in shock uh, but with a stable systolic blood pressure the various options available are dobutamine milinone or and uh, levosimendan uh, so as you know levosimendan is a calcium synthesizer uh, milinone is a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor and dobutamine is a <coughs> catecholamine but dobutamine uh, you have to be very careful because it is an inodilator and because of it is its action on the blood vessels it can cause a vasodilatation and as a result of which it can cause hypotension also then moving to the vasodilators you have two vasodilators that is the uh, ntg and the nesiritide uh, which is a uh, human bnp uh, analog so ntg as you all know is a potent venodilator uh, and an arterial dilator also but it is more potent a venodilator and it can it can very uh, easily uh, relieve uh, pulmonary congestion in patients with acute decompensated heart failure with with pulmonary vasodilatation so dose titration uh, depends on the blood pressure of the patient uh, decrease in the venous pressure will improve the transrenal perfusion pressure and increase the gfr but but still whether it is uh, has any long term benefits on renal function it is not clear coming to nesiritide multiple trials were done uh, as you as i already told you it is a synthetic bnp analog it is an effective vasodilator with a mild diuretic action its administration can result in venous arterial and coronary vasodilatation decreasing the preload and afterload effectively increasing the cardiac output but multiple trials we mag fusion 1 fusion 2 uh, trials done using nesiritide in crs found there was a symptomatic relief from heart failure but no significant improvement in renal function coming to the ac inhibitors or arbs like i already told you the most important uh, pathophysiological uh, cause for uh, aka in uh, heart failure is activation of ras <clears throat> so ras inhibition is one of the key component in patients with lv systolic dysfunction this improves survival in patients with heart failure and prevents renal insufficiency in diabetic nephropathy and other forms of chronic kidney disease uh, the cooperative north scandinavian inalapril study uh, clearly showed that in severe heart failure patients uh, with a creatinine of more than 2 uh, the, there were show, the, uh, there were improved outcomes uh, with uh, ac inhibitors compared to placebo uh, but they but they did not use uh, ac inhibitors if the creatinine was more than 3.4 <clears throat> then uh, to reduce the incidence of renal deterioration patient should be started on lowest dose of ac inhibitor uh, and then uh, gradually the dose should be titrated ac inhibitor should be avoided if the patient is dehydrated and if there is a concomitant use of any other nephrotoxic medication AC inhibitor therapy in patients with baseline renal dysfunction is associated with significant long term benefits and should be used in routine clinical practice unless there is an absolute contraindication like bilateral renal artery stenosis but if the creatinine is more than 4 then probably you should be a little cautious and you should be monitoring the creatinine level when you are using a AC inhibitor so in our particular patient already he was on AC inhibitor uh, with a ongoing ACS the ras activation will be very high Uh, so suddenly uh, stopping an ac inhibitor will be a little uh, dangerous so using anti hyperkalemic measures i will still uh, advise to continue ac inhibitors in my patient a little word about vimada that is valsartan and uh, sacbitril uh, the the drug which is available since 2012 and there were multiple trials which showed a good benefit like pioneer and evaluate where they showed that Uh, it came with a uh, very good improvement in heart failure compared to other ac inhibitors but this particular meta analysis which compared all the major studies done uh, with this drug compared to the routine ac inhibitors uh, the forest plot clearly shows that there is no significant uh, outcome difference uh, between this drug and the routine ac inhibitors uh, the reason why i mentioned a word about this is this, this is a favorite of all the cardiologists can be used in crs1 like other ac inhibitors but it comes with a huge uh, cost because each trip costs around 1000 bucks so uh, coming to the uh, now that we have understood crs1 and 2 we'll try to understand the easier ones that is the crs3 and crs4 
CRS3, uh, like I already told you, it is acute renal cardiac syndrome. That is acute failure of kidney causing acute heart failure. So what could be the causes of this? It could be a contrast-induced acute kidney injury or a drug-induced acute kidney injury or a post-inflammatory glomerulonephritis or a rhabdomyolysis or an acute pyelonephritis secondary to uh, gram-negative sepsis or a post-obstructive uropathy, all of which can cause acute heart failure. The pathophysiology is again the same, either the hemodynamic-mediated, wherein there will be fluid and water retention, hypertension, which will increase the afterload and it will increase the LV uh, uh, workload. Uh, the humoral mediated wherein there is a sympathetic activation and a RAS activation which again causes vasoconstriction and increase the LV workload. Then the immune mediated uh, pathophysiology wherein release of inflammatory mediators itself will cause <coughs> cardiac myocyte damage and then electrolyte imbalance like hyperkalemia and hypokalemia can cause rhythm issues acid-based disturbances like acidosis, which can decrease the cardiac contractility. Uh, so these are the various uh, causes of uh, various uh, pathophysiological mm, mm, ways by which an acute kidney injury can cause acute uh, <coughs> heart failure. Treating these uh, causes of acute kidney injury will uh, help in preventing acute heart failure, like a contrast in use acute kidney injury. You can think of hydration even prior to contract contrast exposure. If your unit uh, practices the use of N-acetylcysteine, you can use N-acetylcysteine. Urinary alkalinization is also used by some units. Uh, personally, hydration is the only thing which can be, which is helpful for contrast-induced AKI. Drug-induced AKI, avoid all nephrotoxic medications. Uh, rhabdomyolysis, again, hydration is may, plays the major role apart from urinary alkalization. Acute pyelonephritis, find out the causative organisms, treat it post-obstructive uropathy, relieve the obstruction immediately. So these are the treatment for the acute uh, kidney injury uh, in the CRS3, which will um, which uh, uh, treated if early will prevent the acute heart failure. Coming to the CKD4, uh, uh, CRS type 4, wherein chronic kidney disease will lead to chronic heart disease. CRS, uh, chronic kidney disease, like you all know, in, is in five stages, stage one, stage two, stage three to stage five, and stage five with dialysis. So in stage one, stage two, the, usually the patients come with uh, predisposing uh, comorbidities like diabetes, dyslipidemia, obesity, which again are risk factors for heart failure. Then uh, smoking per se can cause vasoconstriction and increased uh, LV workload uh, because of increased afterload. Uh, then in stage three to stage five, uh, there will be a calcium and phosphorus abnormalities as a result of which there will be increased atherosclerosis. Then there will be increased uh, valvular uh, uh, malformations, uh, then neurohumoral activation, which will again increase the LV afterload as a result of which LV workload increases. And in stage five with the dialysis, the patient uh, uh, is again uh, uh, continuously, the heart is under stress because of the dialysis where there is continuous fluid shifts which are happening during dialysis. And there is continuous blood, blood membrane interaction and blood catheter interaction as a result of which there will be a cytokine immune mediated reaction as a result of which there will be cytokine uh, production which continuously happens in dialysis patients. So how will you diagnose? You diagnose it either by using creatinine or you can use novel markers like cystatin C or NGAL uh, which can help you in early detection of uh, uh, LV uh, failure in CKD patients, and you can detect heart failure by using your routine BNP and troponin. Treatment, AC inhibitors, ARBs, and beta blockers are the only treatment. Uh, the AC inhibitors, uh, ARBs, a small uh, trial of, of candensectin in dialysis patients demonstrated to reduce cardiac events and fatal arrhythmias. Beta blockers, Cisketal randomized 114 dialysis patients to receive beta blocker or placebo and demonstrated a significant reduction in cardiovascular mortality and a trend towards reduction in the occurrence of sudden death. And finally, coming to the cardiorenal syndrome, that is the CRS5, wherein systemic conditions lead to uh, uh, cytokine storm and lead to multi organ failure, wherein uh, heart and kidney are also involved and they are called as. Uh, cardiorenal syndrome 5. Uh, so treating the systemic diseases uh, and if there is a sepsis or septic shock or if there is a vasculitis will lead to early, diagnose, will, early diagnosis of these systemic disorders 
uh, and early treatment of these will prevent the organ failure. Now in the future of uh, CRS, future is all biomarker guided. Uh, early diagnosis of CRS and early management may probably uh, help in uh, preventing the other organ failure and uh, faster recovery of the patient. These are the various biomarkers, but because of the e because of the difficulty in availability and the cost, we are still not using it on a regular basis. So my take home message for the day will be CRS cardiorenal syndrome one can ha still happen in heart failure patients with preserved ejection fraction, even if the patient is not in shock uh, with the various pathophysiological basis, which has already been explained in detail. Like in our particular case, we the patient was not in shock. Patient's BP was on the higher side, but still he had an acute kidney injury. And the cornerstone of treatment in CRS1 and 2 is diuretic, diuretic, and diuretic. Even if the creatinine is elevated, unless the patient is completely dehydrated and in, is in shock, you have to think of diuretics because venous decongestion is the most important thing. Diuretic resistance is more common in CRS type 2 because these are, they are already in sodium and fluid overload condition and they are, they are uh, already on diuretics. So whenever you have a diuretic resistance, think of using a loop diuretic as an infusion and you can add on a thiazide or a spironolactone. In spite of all these efforts, if the patient is not responding, then probably you have to think of an ultrafiltration. Then in spite of all these things, if the patient is in shock, then those subset can, you can think of using an inotrope. ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers can be literally used in all types of CRS unless the patient is in shock because these are the only drugs which will inhibit the RAS, uh, which is the major pathophysiological basis which, which, is, which, is co which correlates organ failure. Early diagnosis and early management is better in uh, CRS5, early management of septic shock, early management of uh, vasculitis will probably help in faster recovery of your patient. So uh, we, we have talked, we spoke just about heart and uh, uh, kidney, uh, uh, but there is an organ crosstalk going on between all the organs in the body. And uh, to take you forward, I think the ne uh, next talk will be uh, by Nanda Kishore on hepatorenal syndrome. Thank you. Thank you.